thanks very much, Vinton, everyone at KX, uh, for inviting me here. Um, quick show of hands, who is not currently doing any Q, K, plus development? Excellent. Uh, all right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Even, <laughs> even if you're lying for my benefit, so that's very kind of you. All right, well, I won't ask the next question, which is who's, not, who's uh, uh, looking at using it outside finance since we have such a small sample size. So is anyone here do, using it outside finance? Oh, good. Excellent. All right. That's great. All right, uh, last, uh, last survey question. Uh, preferred accent, Canadian or Irish? <laughs> all right. Irish. French or Irish? <laughs> yes, too. and I, I suppose if we're going to talk Irish, we have to, you know, which county, which village, which uh, hedgerow uh, we go to. So, um, uh, again, my name is Mike Thomas. Uh, some of you may know me from my previous incarnation, which was uh, BB of Engineering and Dyer Research Labs. And we were recently, as in uh, within the last couple of weeks, uh, our team joined uh, a newly created uh, arm of FD called FD Labs, where we'll be doing uh, sort of much of the same thing we're doing at Bidera, which is focusing on applied uh, advanced R&D uh, particularly in the areas of uh, big data and uh, Internet of Things, pervasive computer. Um, so uh, I thought I'd give just a very quick flavor, you know, 10 minutes, hopefully no more, uh, of sort of our experience coming from non-traditional or traditional languages and then coming over and adopting uh, QKDB for, as our general purpose programming language. That isn't to say we don't still use other languages, <coughs> we do, um, but uh, our bread and butter to the tune of I'd say 90 to 95 percent of all our back-end server processing is all KDB plus, and in many ways uh, not sort of handling the traditional type of data. So, um, you know, what did we build? I won't belabor this uh, too extensively, but essentially what we built was a platform for doing uh, collaborative analytics, uh, multi multiple analysts, uh, and letting them sort of live in data. Um, there's a lot of platforms out there that let you sort of ask questions and you know, press a button come back, wait, uh, and but they don't really let you iterate or sort of live in the data. I mean, we came up with a sort of tagline, you know, think, compute, see. We want to enable analysts across multiple domains to be able to say, oh, I wonder what would happen if I asked this question. You know, have a computation run at scale and then get an answer back visually or otherwise uh, so that people can start asking questions that they currently feel that they can't ask. Uh, so that's the end goal. Um, we can get all the way there. We still, we still can get there. Um, just a screenshot to show that, you know, convince you that we actually did build something. I'm not going to get into a demo or anything, but uh, basically, in the end of the day, it was an IDE uh, with a debugger and a whole bunch of other stuff to do KDB plus development, as well as an analytical visual layer that included a spreadsheet where uh, Q is a scripting language, uh, full visualization layer that lets people interact with visuals in a non programmatic way, uh, again, leveraging KDB plus on the back end. So what I'm really going to talk about is how did we use KDB Plus to build this? They say that this this platform it uses KDB Plus for the analytic, analytical part, but everything else on the back end is also written in uh, in Q. Um, so it consists of roughly 30 modules. Um, some of these are quite small, you know, tens of lines of code even, one or two functions, to uh, very large modules uh, uh, split across uh, multiple uh, namespaces where they could be. You know, thousands of uh, thousands of line of code and a few hundred functions. Uh, as I said, we, we use this to build pretty much everything um, other than certain libraries we wrapped, which already existed in C. So a uh, distributed version control system, a debugger, you know, like a document gen a documentation generator, ETL tools, configured management, variation <coughs> management. You know, why did you do all this? Uh, often there were two reasons. One was early on, uh, which I'll talk about, we wanted to build things to learn about the language and how best to use it. Uh, so some of these things certainly you can get off the shelf, uh, but since we had an educational process to undergo anyway, we built them. Others we found that the, the other sort of uh, possibilities were lacking, uh, so we, we sort of bit the bullet and went up and built them ourselves. So, uh, this all translates to about 30,000 lines of Q code, uh, which is a fairly significant application. Um, uh, small by sort of traditional k -Log standards if you're using a traditional programming language. Um, it's always hard to judge and get an apples to apples comparison where you say, you know, language A versus language B and, you know, programmers are productive, not productive, but um, we have two instances which are sort of interesting, uh, where one, we took a, a JS application uh, that we've done and rewrote it 
in Q, uh, and a couple others where we took in some C code and rewrote it in Q. Uh, and we were getting between you know sort of three to ten x uh, compression on the, the number of lines of code, um, with a fairly consistent, uh, pretty close sort of number of uh, man hours to to develop each. So I'm not claiming that's always true, uh, but that, that, that is something that we see uh, with customers and in our own experience that uh, there is a bit of a win there. Uh, the expressivity of the language does pay off uh, once you've learned it and you can really sort of, you know, especially for prototyping, you can just fly through things uh, very quickly. Uh, a side note, our repository uh, that we store all the code in is actually a self-displayed uh, table. Uh, so the entire history of every commit, every change, is there, which lets us do very interesting metrics across the code base uh, to learn about you know, areas where we're making mistakes, where we're fixing the same bug, that type of thing. So, um, I'll go through these quickly, and this is a you know, point where someone will see if I weigh as much as a duck and say, burn the witch, burn the witch. Uh, for the heretical things, I'm going to say you know, this, this crowd probably does things in a, in a different way. Uh, again, these are sort of what I would say are uh, lessons learned uh, coming in uh, to QKDB Plus, uh, knowing nothing other than spending an hour with Simon, uh, which is which is a better start than many people get, granted. But um, so one thing I, I sort of mentioned was uh, we identified two projects, and we said let's take one of them. Okay, we've got an existing system. You know, I'm not talking about you know many many years of effort here. I'm talking about things that are small, two to four weeks for a, for a person. Take one, rewrite it in Q. Have somebody do that. Take another thing, something you've got to need to get done, haven't done it yet, implement, implement it in Q. Compare, contrast. One gives you a way to nicely, you know, start learning how existing paradigms, languages are mapping into Q. The other says, let's, you know, I'm going to try and forget everything I know, which is a useful sort of technique coming into this, and how do I then take this language and try and solve this potentially in a new way? You know, where did my, oh, where did all my control structures go? How did I, you know? How do I come about this differently? And you won't get it, you know, the correct way the first time. But this starts the process that says, okay, um, there are different ways of doing these operations. Let's start learning about which they are. Um, you know, I've, so a lot of this is motherhood and apple pie and could be applied to sort of any programming exercise. But you know, don't rewrite everything. You're just coming in new. Um, you should only be writing things that need to be written anyway. Uh, and in particular, when you're coming in with a new uh, language, so pick something that's high value. Pick, pick a thing that you're bringing the language in for, um, and then only have to rewrite as necessary. Um, you know, having been mired in J and I and years have passed, you know, the, the C, C++ interop, uh, and indeed other language interop is pretty good. Uh, so that if you've got existing libraries, existing platforms, they're easily leveraged. Uh, and there's always, you know, with the addition of WebSockets now and RESTful interfaces, there's always a way to unlock value out of existing uh, data. You know, it's not like years ago where it's like, oh, we decided we're going to move to Java. All right, everyone, let's get out and let's rewrite everything. That's no longer uh, necessary. I really was not necessary then. But um, naming is really big. Trying to come up with naming conventions across the team uh, when you when you don't have sort of public private protections built into a language as you do in something like Java, um, you at least need to be consistent in naming so you can identify where these boundaries are, and you can in fact then write tools uh, for identifying when they've been crossed and you don't think they should be. You know, it doesn't prevent someone from physically going in. I mean, strictly speaking, you could rewrite handlers and do this type of thing, but that's you know, probably a step for, step too far. Um, but it lets you get this this common platform for, for going forward. Um, reasonably long variable names are actually okay. You don't have to use uh, single uh, single letters. Uh, you know, I'll say uh, I've really come around a bit on this. I know the Kool-Aid every year is finally coursing through my veins, and I, I can see the appeal and some, but uh, the way I, I view it is, the really terse short variable, variable names to me are akin to a DSL. So if you've got a very contained problem, a very small module or component, you can quickly define, if you only need four or five of these variable names within, you can define them, and then you, you, there's a very clear mental map to this. Uh, once that starts getting larger, uh, you start running out of variables for one, uh, and then you start getting to a modular multi-component area where you're starting to have to switch context between different applications that do different things. So do WNS here always, is it always, you know, window and server or what happens in this domain where those variables make a different So adding two or three extra letters 
uh, doesn't cost you anything with the interpreter. Uh, so it's it's for, for readability, it's a it's a huge win. Um, commenting, you know, judicious use of, of inline comments as well as something like a Java doc or something of that nature really helps again with onboarding. Uh, I'm going to talk about I think on the next slide very quickly about you know we typically well, we, not typically we have never hired an experienced KDE plus programmer. Everyone comes in first second year uh, university student. They're with us for a couple of years and then we hire them when they graduate. So. Uh, having this sort of documentation is a real boom for someone who's used to some sort of C syntax uh, heritage language uh, to get them up to speed and, and, and run it. Um, eventually, they also drink the Kool Aid and start to run down the path and try and make, no, I can fit it on one line now. I can make it you know, twice as fast. It's already one millisecond. It's, it's fine. Um, and code review, uh, not as a means to check on design or uh, catch bugs, though those are also you know, very good reasons to do it. Uh, but particularly early, and we still do this, uh, not as much as we should, but you know, Friday at lunch we sort of do you know, the, the QKDB tip of the week, trick of the week, gotcha of the week, uh, where we compare and contrast different ways of doing things. As I say, there's, you know, if you want to index into a list, you know, pick your thousand ways of doing it. Um, and there's legitimate use for all or almost all of those. Um, so especially when new people are coming at it, it's great for them to say, oh, I did it this way, I did it this way and compare and contrast uh, and sort of, again, come to a common paradigm within the organization to say, when we try to solve this problem, we solve it this way and it becomes more readable uh, for everyone. Uh, so a bad pun. Um, you know, is, it is not just for finance. Uh, and we're seeing this, that actually a, a, a good sample of people here are doing something outside finance. Uh, our background is completely ex-finance, uh, utilities, pharmaceuticals, um, public defense, these are all verticals in which there are uh, existing uh, KDB Plus customers. Uh, I know that uh, you know, KDB Plus, uh, KX and FD are talking to lots of people in those as well as others. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the potential for this technology is, is, is massive. Uh, there's lots of opportunity uh, given big data, you know, I hate the term big data, copious data. The real problem is you want to access data that you currently can't. That could be a million rows, it could be a trillion rows, but there's something that's preventing people from accessing data uh, and a lot of it's just uh, you know, lacking an expressive way of formulating some of these queries. Um, it's only for data, again, we've written everything I've just talked about. Uh, now, at the end of the day, is it most programming about data anyway? Uh, but it's not just about fast data. It's about you know, manipulating traditional data structures, traditional data in a, in a traditional way. Uh, difficult to maintain. Again, that's not been our experience. Um, any language can get you into an ungodly mess. Uh, you just want to burn and start again. Um, so again, having the right discipline and the right uh, procedures in place goes a long way to, to mitigating that. And that's, that's true for, for all languages. Uh, and difficult to learn. Again, our experience is onboarding co-ops with you know, almost one to two years of university. Uh, the programs there at that point are typically something like Java or C. Um, some of them are now starting to see the light and introducing more scheme and, and list-like uh, education back into the curriculum. Uh, but they typically have never heard of APL or vectors uh, and have little to no other than potentially scheme exposure to any sort of uh, anything resembling a functional language. Um, and our experience is that you know, after say four to five weeks, the, the person doing JS is as proficient in JS as the person is in Q having spent the, the same amount of time. So, um, you know, and I, my experience is that there also comes shortly after that, this large step up in the Q programmer as they sort of, that, that sort of non-procedural non way, just that, that light actually goes to full brightness. And like, oh, right, yes, okay, I get, get rid of all these, each is, and I can replace it with this, and I can get rid of these control structures. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, all languages have a purpose. There's no one language that solves all problems. Uh, but for from my experience, uh, Q is as good a general purpose language as, as Q and K as there are out there. Um, so, that's it. Thank you.